Okay, so this panel is called Image Layers. Uh, it deals with the way in which images proliferate, circulate, mutate, and in a sense come to serve many masters. Uh, how images are forms of political expression, forms of behavior, and incidentally, forms of art. We have four panelists today, uh, Abdu Hassan, Hannah Barden, and Sean Brooke. Actually, I'm sorry, I, th I think Maggie Mayhem, uh, it seems like she was unable to make it, so we'll actually be a three-person panel today, um, which means we have more time for a question and answer. Uh, as for me, my name is Seth Water. Uh, I'm currently finishing a PhD in modern culture and media at Brown University. Uh, my research interests are film, technology, um, aesthetics, the history of criticism, mostly as that devolves upon the human body on film. Um, and some of my work is appearing uh, in the uh, new or forthcoming issue of Grey Room when it should be out imminently. Um, in any case, uh, so I'll introduce the panelists individually as they come up uh, to give their papers. Our first panelist is uh, Abdu Hassan. Uh, he's a programmer and digital culture researcher working on interrogating the boundaries between computer science and digital culture. Uh, he describes himself as a wordsmith, irony enthusiast, and a coincidental hater of categories. His uh, paper is called Mannequin Challenge, Reclaiming Space and Time. Um, okay. Uh, hey everyone, Tad uh, Rahman Hassan Shoreda Abdu. Really an honor for me to be here. I'll be talking about the mannequin challenge in time and space. Um, so before I start, I wanted to you know talk a bit of, about why I chose the subject of mannequin challenge. Uh, and based on some of the work of you know black memes uh, by Laura. Um, I'm Jackson and Arya Dean. Um, just like most memes and artifacts of reality, it, uh, the mannequin challenge is a product of uh, black labor, uh, imaginative labor. Um, so, and like most artifacts that produced by black labor, they're always uh, misappropriated, taken out of their original context for the sake of uh, flat relevance. Uh, and it's important for us to interrogate the narrative of the life cycle of the meme in that sense um, and see where uh, everything fits in. And for me, it's uh, Mannequin Challenge is uh, really an inter interesting subject of interrogation, mainly because of the way it was uh, instrumentalized. So for most, okay, this is, uh, okay, so it says relevance versus design. It's, uh, it went off for some reason. Um, so for memes, uh, usually memes come up in a context of relevance. They uh, reciprocate because they're relevant to everyone. And this depri deprives a lot of black labor, uh, imaginative labor, from uh, you know, being, tra being traced to its original context. So you'd have things that are artifacts of black culture and they, they become a SpongeBob meme as they go down the line, uh, just for the sake of everyone relating to it. Um, and this comes from the idea of the origins of memes, uh, the idea that was popularized by Richard Dawkins, that memes are actually uh, social equi equivalents of genes. They reciprocate kind of organically, uh, and this undermines the agency of the subjects um, propagating the memes. Uh, for me, I, I, through the mannequin challenge, I argue that there is actually a dis social design factor that instr instrumentalizes the mannequin challenge in a different way. Uh, so for me, it it's, uh, uses an instrument to reclaim certain things on three levels. So first, reclaiming actual physical space, the physical spaces in which the, the mannequin challenge takes place. And the second part is reclaiming imagined spaces. Um, so spaces that aren't physical, spaces that, you know, like public, spa public spheres uh, in film and industry. Um, and the last is uh, reclaiming authenticity. So the narrative that um, social media out outlets uh, have a hegemony over the way you present yourself. So the mannequin challenge coincidentally or, you know, by design, uh, has been inflicted in, in these three reclamation processes. And I'll elaborate on them. Uh, so in terms of uh, physical space, 
um, you could see through the work of Lefebvre and Edward Said that, you know, space is an invention and it's heavily intertwined with the subjects that inhibit the space and the actions in which is done by space. And by the memories that, that you know, that will remain of that space uh, is utilized to reclaim it. Uh, so by simply showing what you do in a space and immortalizing that somehow through a vehicle of virality, through a meme, uh, through a little video, through the challenge, you kind of claim that space. Um, and that's why you had a lot of marginalized communities, a lot of... Um, so the meme started in, a, in October 2016 um, in a black um, uh, high school. Uh, but it's been, uh, it's hard to trace it back to that. It, it's gone everywhere from there. It's gone to sports teams. Um, I've seen back home uh, really um, spaces that are alternative and on the fringes of society that have used this to take up the forefront. And much like physical space. So this is uh, Hillary Clinton um, doing the mannequin challenge. Uh, a few days before her re-election. And this is one of her tactic, tactics as if uh, I'm already there, I'm already in the institution, this is my space. Um, we can see how effective it was at the end, but this is one thing she did. So much like physical spaces, there's also you know, me mental imagined spaces that the mannequin challenge is involved in. And um, halfway through uh, you know, the evolution of the meme, uh, it's been heavily decontextualized. And uh, just like blackness uh, mutates and there's different variations of it to survive as the one collective being, um, they the, uh, a variation of the mental of the mannequin challenge uh, was the Black Lives Matter challenge, which uh, featured certain videos of, um, of police brutality. Uh, that were uh, kind of on the forefront 2013. They were revived and the narrative was retold through the Mannequin Challenge. Um, and there is um, a prominent example of this um, is one thing that was done by the Latin, uh, uh, Latin Initiative. Uh, and it had to do with how, um, sorry, uh, Asian Initiative by... Um, it was shown, sorry. Um, it's shown how uh, Asians are represented in the media. Um, and, it, and it moved from the original soundtrack, which played over the images, which is Black Beatles, to uh, the actual phrases that were said uh, in the media about you know, Asians and, and, and you know, how uh, the space they were given in, in film. Am I supposed to bow to say hello? I had forgotten that your parents came all the way from Thailand to serve George Washington. We want to congratulate Glamour on their phenomenal accomplishments and for inspiring women all across the country. Everyone around me, they feel connected to something I'm not. Americans in this country. We got long duck dog, so we got a long way to go. So this was really interesting to me uh, because it was really conscious of the fact that uh, you know the camera had to flee free flow to move in the space uh, that they could end the sequence of you know stillness and the girl wakes up at the end. She changes at the end. It was really uh, orchestrated to serve a certain purpose. Um, and as for the last uh, layer of, of reclamation, which is reclaiming authenticity. Uh, so you've had in the you know recent period a kind of fight for you know hegemony from you know the, the bigger uh, social media outlets um, that claim that claim that they provide the best image of the physical self online, that they produce the best you, the most compatible you with real life. 
Um, and that was based on a concept of rawness. So you'd have Facebook Live, you'd have uh, stories on Instagram, you'd have Snapchat. The raw, unfiltered moment is the real moment. It's the real you. Uh, and that was marketed to people constantly as this is what you need to do. Uh, but this kind of threw this all out in the trash. It went through a different argument. It's clearly something that you have to orchestrate, you have to design. Uh, it's a still pose, the camera moves freely. Uh, you'd have a lot of, it's a big collaboration. It's not as raw as the trend in social media and authenticity have shown it to be. And a reason why that is, I investigated the camera technique itself. And um, this is a scene from Birdman, uh, which uh, had, took a, had an Oscar in 2015, I think. Someone correct me if I'm wrong. And uh, one big part about this movie was that it was filmed in a single shot. And according to the uh, director, Inerito, he mentioned that without this technique, the movie would have lost a lot of its you know, emotional complexity because it's, this is how we live our lives. This is, it's a single shot, time and space are linear. So for everyone, the past is, is produced. It's, it's not really a tangible thing, and the future is also produced and imagined. Uh, you only have the present, you're kind of locked into the present. And in his words, uh, he says, we use editing to remember our lives, relate to our, li our lives, to see films and enca encapsulate time in books. That's why we're addicted to fiction, because that makes us escape from that single tondle that is time, is linear, and what we don't have an escape. So the mannequin challenge kind of really flirts with that idea, is that you have control, you have design over the camera angle, over the whole moment, the totality of the moment, without having to resort to being raw. And it's entirely platform independent. It's an, ancient, it's an old ca camera technique. Uh, it's not dependent on a certain technology provided by Facebook, by Twitter. It's something that is standalone. Um, and this serves as the final artifact of, um, of the mannequin challenge. It's, it's just people doing their own thing, exploring, kind of escaping from the, you know, the trap of the linear uh, influx of, of time and, and, uh, and space. Um, yeah, and that concludes my talk. Thank you very much. Okay, so our next speaker will be uh, Hannah Barden. She's a writer and researcher based in London, where she's working towards her doctorate uh, at Birkbeck, uh, University of London. The working title of her dissertation is A Dialogical Analysis of Internet Memes. She also currently holds a post at Tate Britain, overseeing a project uh, that digitizes and provides online access to the Tate's archive. Uh, in case there are any children in the audience, please cover their ears. The title of her paper is Operation Mindfuck, A Photocopier, A Conspiracy, A God, A Frog. Okay. Uh, hello, thank you for having me. And there will be other um, curse words in this presentation, so I apologise in advance. Um, okay, uh, yes, I am here to talk about um, meme magic, which is kind of as weird as it sounds. It's the purported belief that the proliferation of internet memes and shitposting can will events into occurring. Uh, the term has been most frequently used on uh, Chan sites, 4chan and 8chan, uh, and they're pretty infamous now, but they're bulletin boards that deal with um, specific topics or themes, each board has a, an interest, uh, a moderation policy, and then maybe each board has a, maybe a distinct uh, characteristic or sensibility. Um, the term meme magic was first used in 2015 when some involved in what's called Bane posting, a very popular meme um, which poked fun at the opening sequence of The Dark Knight Rises started to wonder if their intense memeing had caused the German uh, wing's plane crash in 2015. 
the thinking behind it was that their kind of shared investment in a, this imaginary has somehow willed the events into occurring and they drew correlations between the content of the film, their memes and the event itself. Um, more recently, meme magic has been used uh, on, politically, on the politically incorrect boards, um, which, as they sound, are boards where you can discuss pretty much anything. There are no moderation policies, which means that mainstream politics are discussed, but also the most extreme forms of um, kind of hate speech are there as well. So it's sometimes called a containment board. And the term's also popped up on Reddit, the Donald, which gives a clue about what I'm going to be discussing in a few minutes' time. So as a quick qualification, I'll say that what follows is not to um, overdetermine the role of meme magic in the outcome of the US election. That's obviously a much broader issue, but it's to consider what kind of a type of magic might have been detected by Paul. And I'll start with the story, uh, which could begin in 2800 BC, but for the sake of brevity, I'll pick up the thread in 1963 in the office of uh, New Orleans District Attorney Jim Garrison. Some of you might know that name. Uh, more specifically still, we'll start with Jim Garrison's photocopier. Um, this is then a rare piece of equipment from which some powerful ideas were sent out into the world. Uh, the photocopier was hijacked off after office hours by these guys, Greg um, Hill and Kerry Thornley, who were friends, counterculturalists, who used it to run off copies of a book that they'd co-authored, uh, The Principia Discordia. Um, this book was written in a tone that was both sincere and mocking, uh, earnest and ironic, and it introduced its few readers to Discordianism, which is a quasi-parodic religion whose followers, Discordians, worship the um, Greek goddess of chaos, Eris. The Principio encouraged Discordians to induce epistemic chaos by fucking shit up, basically, get, getting involved in minor acts of civil disobedience, pranks, jokes, small subversions. Um, and these ideas resonated within the Hill and Thornley friendship group, but, and also wi more widely um, as the decade rolled on, uh, with the Principia being remixed, reproed, and, and uh, kind of reaching new audiences, kind of like a zine. And let's situate this, it's... 1963. So we're in the wake of the Kennedy assassination, a time when the American public was coming to terms with the event itself and the fractured narrative around culpability and the subsequent disclosures from the Warren and Rockefeller commissions. A public uh, distrust in federal government was setting in amidst an epoch of increasing media complexity, paranoia, conspiracy. That's the, the high point there, it's 63 and it goes down from then. And um, of course, a burgeoning counterculture. By 67, the Principia Discordia had been read by this man, Robert Anton Wilson, the writer, who with Bob Shea, his collaborator, chose to significantly expand on its ideas. Together they went on to make Discordianism central to the Illuminatus trilogy. Oops, sorry. <laughs> um, a series of uh, novels that they co-authored that were published in 75. The trilogy is best described as conspiracy fiction and it portrays a world where nothing is as it seems, where the diabolical Illuminati who we still talk about today, um, pulled the strings. The Kennedy assassination was part of a huge cover-up. Sea monsters from the depths and the heroic discord Discordians ran amok. Operation, uh, sorry, Wilson also just, um, further detailed Discordian religious practices and one of note is called Operation Mindfuck. Operation Mindfuck describes a decentralized campaign to sow discord, with those involved engaging in covert, anonymized pranks, hoaxes, and scams. As the name implies, Operation Mindfuck was less concerned with material change, but aimed to induce perceptual reorientations, challenging belief systems, worldviews. It was basically an assault on consciousness. And it wasn't affiliated to any kind of political agenda, all and everyone was considered fair game. One way a discord you could go about getting involved in Operation Mindfuck would be to invoke what's known as chaos magic. This is a contemporary magical practice which holds that belief itself is a tool and enough belief can will changes into effect. Chaos magicians facilitate change by creating sigils, an image or a symbol that represents your will to codify it and project it into the universe. When a lot of people share a will and coalesce around a single image, a powerful hyper sigil emerges. Uh, the Principia Discordia itself is a form of sigil. Thornley and Hill shared these ideas that they codified, which travelled from the photocopier to their community, to the wider community, to Wilson, to the printing press, and then beyond. Perhaps unsurprisingly, Discordianism, bio Illuminatus, had a particular impact on early hacker groups emerging in the 70s and 80s. Discordianism's irreverence appealed to those who actively resisted the systems um, that imposed uh, restrictions on, on lifestyle and choices, so that's social, technological and legal, and there's also a libertarian reading to this as well. 
And the relationship between the Illuminatus books and hackers is well evidenced. Some hacker groups took the name directly from the series, such as um, Cult of the Dead Cow, Carl Koch was an avowed fan, the Chaos Computer Club. But why is this significant? Well, at one level, it's interesting to examine the makeup and influences on, in, on a nascent internet culture, the early adopters, and Discordianism's an Operation Mindfuck certainly reads as a proto-form of lulls, those digitally afforded anonymized pranks uh, and disruptions. And while few on maybe poll today wouldn't know the name of Illuminatus or the Principia, those uh, would be attuned, they would be in tune to the goal of Operation Mindfuck. And as mentioned at the start, they would almost certainly be familiar with chaos or mean magic because in 2016, mean magic seemed to strike again. <laughs> so, to understand how this was detected, we need to look at some pre-established uh, Chan behaviors. Um, there is a compilation of uh, kind of mean magic artifacts. You've got gods, frogs, symbols. So let's break this down. Let's start with phrase kek. Okay. Uh, Kek is a term frequently used on 4chan and 8chan and also Reddit, and it's a variant of LOL, LOL, um, which came about due to a quirk in World of Warcraft gameplay. Um, Kek, therefore, is already a bit more insidery. It calls on that kind of um, that, that kind of community knowledge, and it's in opposition to like the normie LOL. So it functions as a social identifier. And next, Pepe. Well, Pepe is pretty infamous, metastasizing from an innocuous webcomic to. Uh, Firstly, maybe ironize and then later earnest Nazi signifier, again, much to say here on another day. But um, before that happened, Pepe had long been used on poll as part of their sociolect, well, the established part of their vernacular, so it had a resonance there. Now, when Donald Trump uh, kicked off his campaign in 2015, he really appealed to poll. Ironically or sincerely, it's hard to tell. And long story short, Trump memes met Pepe memes, and then they rapidly proliferated. And that's how memes work, right? They're ever-transforming, remixed and resonant. Um, Trump Pepe then appealed to the alt-right, the anarchist, the alienated, the ironist, the racist, the neo-fascists alike, and others who didn't need to share a coherent, coherent ideology. They didn't, but they did share the symbol. But where was the magic? Well, the then president-elect was doing quite well, surprisingly, and um, they started thinking, with Bain posting in mind, how, are we some, somehow involved in this? What are we to do with this? And then in 2016, um, a poster to the history board brought this to their attention. Oh, oh, there's, there's an important slide there that's, not <laughs> that's missing. It's a, it's, a, it's a symbol from ancient Egypt. I'll describe it. It's a god called Kuk or Kek, the ancient Egypt, Egypt, uh, Egyptian god of chaos. Um, not only did the word Kek seem significant, but the deity's male form was depicted as a frog or a frog-headed man, so some posts on poll started to form the idea that Pepe was Kek and Kek was or was about to for Trump. Proliferation of the Pepe meme therefore became a powerful magical act. Some, of course, did this with a heavy dose of irony, others became concerned that they'd actually accidentally invoked a god. And seemingly there was more evidence to support this. Um, on 4chan, posts are numbered, and numbers that end in double digits are called uh, dubs or triples or trips, and they're called, also called gets, and it's a course for minor celebration. Posts around Donald Trump seem to get a high amount of gets. Um, elsewhere, Chadelet was unearthed. An obscure Italo disco track which featured a frog in the label, the word magic, and there at the bottom, P-E-P-E, -E, Pepe, and the words also allude to meme making. And this was taken as a further sign and as a hymn. Hmm. So what's going on? Well, a mathematician might say it's probability. Uh, Carl Jung would probably call it synchronicity, the attribution of meaning to a causal events. Uh, and this is uh, in terms of the evidence collated, because humans are pattern spotters after all, and across network communities, this process becomes crowdsourced with meaning detected and ideas shared at unprecedented scale. So it's a recursive, self-fulfilling form of confirmation bias. That in turn begets the, the magic, because to use the language of chaos magic, Pepe became a hypersigil, but power is not derived from belief or will alone, but from proliferation or visibility within a network detention economy. Pepe posts, um, further amplified by the media and Trump and Clinton referencing the meme, and then why wider cultural and algorithmic uh, logics claim to place in discourse and crucially in consciousness. So the comparison between analog operation mindfuck and chaos magic and, oops, and networked uh, laws in the emergence of meme magic allows us to consider what differentiates them, namely that the latter benefited from the affordances of digital. And the effects of disruption within uh, a network culture can be profound. 
History is replete with use of the word magic deployed to explicate events that seem to defy logic or more cynically to obfuscate the complex realities that predicate any given occurrence. Hence, why a questioning of what mean magic actually is is to my mind worthwhile. Because it is powerful, it's the casting of ideas. And in the last year, within a vacuum of wider epistemic chaos, this has benefited an unlikely alliance of anti establishmentarians who reject, for whatever reason, what we could broadly call liberalism. And this must give pause for thought. Being formed of ideas, I mean, magic is incorporeal, but this doesn't necessarily mean that, that uh, its effects are delimited to the immaterial. In Western democracies, it's ideas that underwrite the attainment and then exercise of political power. At then, that mean magic is also referred to as mimetic warfare. Those who derail and disrupt the narrative, setting or undermining agendas, intuit how, in a mediatized, networked uh, attention economy, discord can be weaponized. Uh, our final speaker will be Sean Brook. Uh, she is a doctoral student at the Oxford Internet Institute. Uh, her research focuses on the construction of gendered identities on the pseudonymous web, uh, and in particular on the formation and maintenance of troll and hacktivist identities uh, and the operation of gender politics in online forums. Uh, her talk today is titled, uh, quote, There Are No Girls on the Internet, Gender Performances in the Advice Animal Meme Genre. Hi, uh, so my paper is entitled There Are No Girls on the Internet. Um, in 2006, Time magazine named you Person of the Year. Their decision was based on the expanding growth of user-generated content. But research has shown that those who generate content are almost ubiquitously male. So are you Person of the Year or is it him? Such ideas of gender are often referred to in the rules of the internet. These are tongue and teak edges adages that then reflect how people view the, how they talk online. Rule 30 is there are no girls on the internet, which is the title of this paper. This is also then reinforced with rule 31, which is tits or get the fuck out. This places the burden of proof on those claiming to be female and reinforces the male gaze and sexualization of, anon of anonymous spaces. My research was based on Reddit. Um, Reddit is a platform of the anonymous web in which people um, interact under the basis of usernames. There is a voting system and as a user's post gets voted up or down, they accrue karma, which is um, comparable to social status. Reddit is divided into subpages called subreddits that all focus on particular topics such as bunnies standing up. 57% um, of the users of Reddit, um, Reddit claims are female, so it's particularly interesting to look at how identity is represented in a platform that is relatively gender equal. Um, so when we talk about Reddit and its karma system, one of the practices on um, the site that Masanari identifies is called karma whoring. So karma whoring is also um, a colloquialism within the site. It refers to posting content that you know is going to get upvoted and will make a, a positive response in order to accrue karma and accrue social status. In karma whoring, users will often um, repost stereotypes. They will reflect on these um, generally and communally understood ideas of identity in order to accrue these points. Um, in Masanari's discussion, she talks about toxic techno cultures, in particular the fappening in which pictures, naked pictures of Jennifer Lawrence and other female celebrities were shared around Reddit. Um, these create uh, acceptance of misogyny on such platforms and allow common representations of femininity, particularly in terms of the whore and the bitch, much as is generated in a situation comedy. Uh, if, if we, in considering memes um, within this idea, we can consider them as literal sense-making images. They are actual depictions of how identity is represented on Reddit. They are how um, 
it is organized and how the culture is reflected. So we can consider memes as literal sense making. They refer to the central character often as white and nerdy. This meme here is the Redditor's wife. You can see that the central character is a white man and his wife, which again reinforces ideas of heteronormativity. They focus on the commonalities need, uh, needed for communication. The Redditor is male, the Redditor is heterosexual. Um, Ryan Milner discusses how such memes as this can um, communicate an ideology within a platform. They also commonly reflect in-jokes, um, which defines the, outs the insider and the outsider within these spheres. If we move on to look at the work um, of Kendall, we can see how nerds and geeks are again the centre of of masculinity. So here we have the overly manly man, which is a very common advice animal that's shared throughout Reddit. This mocks the hegemonic ideas of masculinity. Hegemonic masculinity is the dominant practice of how you would achieve manhood within a given culture. So it's usually associated with um, sport and physical prowess. However, in nerd and geek culture, um, this sort of physicality is replaced by technical knowledge. Uh, the geek is and the nerd achieves masculinity through technical competences. Uh, in such culture, women are often portrayed as unattainable sexual objects. They are mocked through heterosexual incompetence. In Kendall's research, um, one of the most prominent phrases that emerged was, did you spiker? This became almost a, a mimetic phrase, which refers to if any of the geeks were able to get a woman, it must have been because they, were, they drugged her. Um, and in this sense, there is this shared joke of heterosexual incompetence, which again reinforces the in-group as male. Um, in looking at race online, Nakamura talks about cybertypes. So cybertypes is very similar to the concept of, of stereotypes, how the method and the technology we use to communicate transforms our ideas of identity. Um, Nakamura talks about cybertypes in a bilateral causal relationship. The offline identity affects the online representations and the online representations affect the offline identity. In these she sees how identity is still typed and it is still mired in oppressive roles even though the body has been left behind or bracketed. She also argues that types are used to, um, to address the liquid idea of identity that we see online in anonymity when we don't know who we're talking to. So in looking at this idea of typing, I also believe that um, memes reflect a literal typing. They actually create these cyber types, much as the stereotypes can be recognized elsewhere in the whore and the bitch. Um, this is a reflection of the successful black man, which then reflects the um, bait and bait and switch format that is very common to advice animal memes. In looking at what I actually um, understand by memes, I am, memes first start as user-generated content, which is what Time were discussing in 2006. This then becomes um, spreadable media. It's something that can be shared around very, very quickly. We then get an emergent meme as these things are reiterated and something becomes a meme when it has a standardized format that we can all recognize. We can say that that is scumbag Steve, that is the overly attached girlfriend. These become recognizable figures to her. Um, my research primarily focuses on advice animals which are a image macro so again like the images I've shown you they have a human picture followed by a, a caption on the top and a caption on the bottom so one of the first memes I looked at in look focusing particularly on um, human stock characters advice animals as these were the ones that raised um, to the most prominent positions during my study was good guy Greg here on the far left and scumbag Steve on the right. So these show a comparison in the way that masculinity is performed in memes. Steve is a, um, sorry, Greg even, is a benevolent alpha. He has a bearded face, he is relaxed, he is an older guy. He represents social ideals as defined by his captions. Uh, in comparison, uh, scumbag Steve can be shown to be displaying a more beta form of masculinity. He is juvenile, he has oversized clothes and his youth gives him no um, right to his belligerent attitude. Um, both of these memes have female counterparts. I can't show, um, uh, scumbag Steve's female iteration here, which is scumbag Stacy, as the image had to be removed because it was from a softcore porn website due to a cease and desist order. 
However, uh, good girl Gina can show sexualization in a very, very similar manner. Um, they refer the ideal girlfriend who is objectified and sexualized. In 2012, um, Redditor Latex Fetish, which is a fantastic name, um, created a bar chart, a categorization survey of all the submissions of Good Girl Gina um, to the subreddit Advice Animals. And she, she or he saw that 66% um, of all submissions were um, gendered. They all referred to this sexualized, objectified identity that existed in Good Girl Gina. If we now to move to look um, beyond how Gina and femininity is presumed, we can look at how um, feminine, uh, feminism is performed as an ideology. So these memes here are feminist frank, and again they show the bait and switch format and um, a humour and quite a positive ideals of feminism. Similarly is um, Hey Girl Ryan Gosling memes. Why this is not strictly an advice animal, memes such as this have been grammared into the advice animal meme genre due to um, their longevity and how long they've been around. Um, with these memes, they both reflect, as this and um, Feminist Frank, they both reflect heterosexuality. They are the feminist man talking to the woman. In the Ryan Gosling sense, it is literally in terms of, hey girl, you are addressing the subject as a girl. And this ties into Judith Butler's idea of girling. You are creating the subject as juvenile, and you, through the juvenility and addressing the girl, through these heterosexual ideas of being wanting to cry with you and thinking that we'd make cute babies, you are then reaffirming this um, power relationship between the man who is calling to the girl and the sexualization and heteronormativity of it. In comparison, when we look at female feminists, they are portrayed in a very, very different manner, as can be um, understood by their names, which is the feminazi and the feminist hypocrite. In these memes, we can see um, Sarah Ahmed's um, The Killjoy Feminist. The feminist is someone who encroaches on this collective idea of happiness. They are depicted open-mouthed. They are seen as intruding on you. And they are seen to be um, hypocritical, offering referencing um, Godwin's law of terms of Nancy, authoritarian. Um, they are incredibly negative in comparison to the very progressive, positively viewed um, male feminists. These contrasting representations um, put uh, men at the center of feminism. If a man is a feminist, he is generally portrayed across these platforms as being very um, positive, understanding, but also very heteronormative. When a woman is a feminist, she is authoritarian, she is encroaching. And it is important to recognize that these are the most popular memes and these are being shared on a platform where 47% of its users are female. So if we go back um, to the title of my thesis, there are no girls on the internet. My argument is there are girls. There are the hey girls of Ryan Gosling. There is good girl Gina who is sexualized and objectified. Um, there is, but there are no women. There are Nazis, there are authoritarians, there are hypocrites, but women do not have an equal voice in this sphere in terms of representations of identity. And this matters because this is a platform which is the ninth most popular website um, in the United States. It is a platform where we get a lot of our memes from and these are reiterated across platforms. Hey Girl Ryan Gosling has been printed out into books that you often find in offices and um, on coffee tables around the globe. These are common ideas of representations. We do need to look at how identity is repre represented and how it may encourage barriers in defining the insider and outsider in online communities. Communication. Thank you. Sorry, do you want to come sit at the uh, front and uh, for Q and A? So we have about um, half an hour for uh, Q&A um, due to the absence of our fourth panelist, so plenty of time. Let me just unwind this. If I... Oh, it's really stuck. Oh, no, I don't think this is going to work, actually. Um, so I guess I'll stand over here and uh, field questions. <clears throat> um, I actually had uh, maybe more of a, a comment. I, I hesitate to call it an insight that's maybe overblown, but um, 
Uh, one of the things I thought was interesting about all three of your um, papers, and thank you all very much, by the way, for um, um, giving such great presentations. Um, the way that you discuss memes, I think, uh, um, tends to be, it almost seems like a kind of behavioristic account to me. It's a way of forming um, uh, a kind of community, community or social bonds around um, uh, a kind of uh, race or, or sexuality or, or political affiliations. Um, so, uh, I mean, I'm wondering if this is a kind of useful rubric for um, thinking about the way that memes interact in the world is really as a kind of um, uh, social behavior. I mean, really no different from something like a handshake or a wink, um, more than um, something like a work of art that, let's say, I make, you know, in private and then I, and then I present to the world for um, people to consume. Though, Abdu, I got the impression from your paper, um, it, it, if I understood you correctly, it was almost like you were arguing for a... Um, a more kind of aesthetically complex meme with your with this emphasis you were putting on editing and, and memory. So that, that's just kind of a comment um, uh, to open up a uh, discussion. And I don't know if that's a useful way of thinking about memes, but it's something that struck me uh, in, in all of your presentations. But I don't know how to, <laughs> I'm not sure how, 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 this, how, how this should work um, for the live stream, but uh, maybe you can just try to project to the audience if you have comments. Or if we have, uh, go ahead. Yeah, so I think that memes can be both this idea of um, a way of communicating as well as a visual art form. I don't think you can necessarily consider them as mutually exclusive um, because if you consider when we go back and we look at um, European art or we look at um, art of the slave trade, they are still representing an ideology of the time and they are a way of communicating um, power structures and if you think about portraits of royalty when they have a, a crown and they have the symbolism within the picture, um, that is also communicating the power of them to them, the fact that it's like based in the church or something very similar. Um, I think for me too there is a, kind of like a dialectic between having a low-res image that you can kind of, you know, mutate and have it propagate easily, and then one that has a lot of meaning and context that, you know, oh, there it is. Uh, so as I mentioned, it's a dialectic between having a low-res image that can, you know, propagate easily, that you can change and edit con con constantly to add layers of meaning relating to you, and one where you kind of just want to push relevance aside and be like, this is my thing. I want to make sure it stays true to itself. There are both memes in a way that they're both units of cultural understanding. You can take them and apply them to your own situation, but I think it just happens in different ways. Um, I think um, the word I keep on coming back to when I think about memes is sociolect, which is a, a dialect based on interest rather than geography, not delimited by being in the same kind of village or whatever as your um, your cohorts, but you're coalescing around a same interest group, so sociolect. Um, and I think that's most my my most um, the most useful way I can think about it. And that means that the, the meaning within memes is mutable. It can mean certain things to certain groups and it can mean slightly different things to other groups and absolutely something almost diametrically opposite to you know, groups elsewhere. Um, with the, um, the uh, Pepe meme, I didn't talk about this in the presentation because of time, but I can do it now instead. <laughs> um, one of the reasons that the Pepe meme started out um, be to become this like, Nazi signifier other than a genuine kind of rise of the um, of the alt-right and neo-fascists is that the people who used the meme in the first place, the, 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 beat, the beaters, the beta group on, um, f on Fortune in particular, felt that their meme was being used by normies too much, notably Katy Perry and Nicki Minaj are using it in their kind of um, in their Facebook or Twitter feed or something and this was like this is our meme, you can't, you can't use it. So they thought well what we'll do is we'll make Pepe into a Nazi to try and make him untouchable, which kind of worked, but at the same time, it really resonated with actual Nazis who then bought into the meme too. So their intention did work, but had these, other, you know, these other consequences too. And so then you get Hillary Clinton who says, oh, well, this is a Nazi symbol, which it wasn't entirely, although it was in part. So that's how, that's how these complicated meanings are detected in different ways by different groups and it all depends on both the symbol itself but your situated experience of it so it's yeah it's it's complicated <laughs> uh do we have questions from the audience yep 
I'm, I'm sorry, could you just speak a, a, a tad louder? So I thought all three panels had a wonderful job of conversations, but my question is for me. Specifically with Pepe, um, when I think about the communities that you're talking about, I think like Dave Sopol's talking about communities of interest, where you have a, a, a group of that are interested in that same ideology. And when you're talking about the symbol in Pepe, I think it's, it's sort of the representation of that community. So as a way of diffusing the magic is one element just simply taking countermeasures or counter messaging and trying to influence the way that particular image is perceived by the community at large. So how do we do that? Uh, so for the live stream, just so everyone can uh, hear, the question is, um, uh, kind of, if I understand it, a uh, reclaiming of the uh, Pepe image through a kind of counter, um, you know, counter tactics to uh, sort of bring it back, and how might, um, how might that be done? Okay. Thank you, and that's a very good question, and something I've been thinking about since this all ha happened. And I guess the way to think about it in terms of my presentation is how to kind of break the spell. And I guess at the end, I talked about the use of the word magic kind of flattens ideas and obfuscates the kind of complicated conditions actually allow these things to occur. So when you think about um, what actually happened with the, the Pepe meme, um, w the kind of the Hillary Clinton disclaimer flattened the issue, it didn't look at all the complexities kind of within it. And I think if we're going to try and interrogate these issues, we've got to think about not just the symbol or the kind of whatever image itself, but all the conditions that allowed it to happen, which includes situated live conditions, the, the technical infrastructure of the boards themselves, the way these things message and share, uh, and of, of course the kind of broader socio-political context that we're operating in. So just, I guess the way to kind of um, break free from these things is actually to look very carefully, very critically at them, and not just accept them as some kind of magical occurrence that has happened, not just a um, uh, not just something that's popped up out of the blue, it's really deep-rooted historical issue that has come into the fore in many ways in the last year. Mean magic is one very small part of it. Um, there's huge issues at play here. And not just assume that this may be typified by Donald Trump, but just kind of happened. This is a deep-rooted historical issue. We need to think very carefully about why and be critical about the media structures that allow it and also the social conditions that afford it as well. getting caught on your knee. Uh, other questions from uh, the audience? Yes. Sean. Sean, okay. Um, I was wondering if you noticed, since we love categorizing so much, um, I was wondering if you noticed a difference in um, the way people use memes that were based on images of real people, like Good Guy Greg or Steve, versus the animals or Pepe or something that's kind of um, not a real person. And then you mentioned there was that issue that you had to remove one of the memes because it, someone had their image distributed and they didn't want to and they, were, they had a legal reason to have it removed. Um, do you notice there's a difference in the way memes are used and in the way that, I don't want to say victims, but the uh, stars of the memes have responded to that? Yeah? Uh, so the question has to do with the um, the the way that um, different kinds of uh, uh, image macro memes, um, whether they have um, uh, individuals in them, uh, recognizable people uh, versus uh, cartoons or animals, and, and the different in there, um, the way that they function. Um, so when people have the images they're removed, they're generally on the grounds of copyright and not necessarily because of the individual themselves. Um, one of the best examples of um, people, well, because there is like this search for who is good guy Greg, which I think has resurged around 4chan recently. But one of the best examples um, is the overly attached girlfriend. Um, so she made a video where she parodied um, Justin Bieber's baby and purposely did it in this overly attached girlfriend way. It was meant to be um, mocking this idea. And then someone um, screen captured that. I can't remember the Redditor's name off the top of my head. Posted it on Advice Animals and then created this, um, again, this parody parody of the girlfriend who is overly attached. Um, after that went viral, that then was um, the overly attached boyfriend emerged and he w uh, that was Fatrick1234 and he posted the image of himself of um, look who I look like. 
Um, Lana Morris, who is the um, central figure of the overly attached girlfriend, has since come on to almost be adopted by Reddit. She has become um, another meme in the misunderstood girlfriend and has actually built quite a successful YouTube career off it. Um, she uses um, a lot of the money that she raises through her YouTube videos for charity. Um, so there is this weird um, internet fame that can come from meme. Um, we have Scumbag Steve as well, who I showed in my um, PowerPoint. He actually ended up making a rap video about being in the meme um, and taking the mickey out of the fact that the, fo the photo had actually been taken by his mum for his album cover, for his rap album. Um, so there is like this quite interesting story behind it, but there's also this very interesting, um, I suppose it's part of Reddit's um, love for original content, of finding about where these representations came from, who are these people and how do they react. Um, Good Girl Gina as well, um, it then played again into the meme um, when she, the photo is from iStock, but then um, the image shown in it did not mind being a meme. So sometimes they play into the narrative that the meme itself creates. Uh, yes, in the third row. Uh, so the question is for Sean, it's um, uh, do you have ideas regarding how to um, equalize uh, gender presence and presentation on the, uh, on the internet? Um, so I'll, I'll answer this in terms of the memes I'm doing and in terms of my doctoral research as well because they're on slightly different strands. Um, when Judith Butler and Sarah Ahmed is talking about um, representations of feminism online, she says that we should never entirely try to control the negative representations because they are part and parcel of standing out and being political. Instead, you should provide alternative narratives. Um, there has been uh, submissions um, of image macros of positive feminist um, memes, but nothing has ever made it to mimetic status. So I think that that, um, and assuming that these spaces are male dominated is one of the primary issues. Um, especially in anonymity. Now my doctoral research looks to see how far these spaces are actually male dominated um, using the um, language and the discourses in which people talk about um, um, themselves and others in anonymity and on the dark web and to see what levels of representation linguistically that are there. So I think that before we can address ideas of gender equality it is better to paint a clearer picture of what it is there and facts such as knowing that 47% of Reddit is female and the existence of um, Reddit's, uh, subreddits such as 2x chromosomes can provide an alternative narrative and that it is important to continue saturating alternative representations um, rather than controlling and criticizing those that already exist. Thank you. Uh, I saw some other hands. Uh, yeah, in the back. This question for Avi, and it's sort of a piggyback off the idea of um, these alternate narratives. With the location of the Andrew Chancer show, the idea of this encounter representation, do you see that as a continuing pattern as we have other memes that pop up that rise to social as a way of using this for social consciousness? Is this a, is this a cycle or pattern that you see that could potentially come down with other memes of a similar nature? Um, uh, so the question is again about a kind of counter meme strategy to push back on um, certain certain kinds of uh, representations, um, specifically in this case, um, uh, Asian American. All right. Um, it's honestly an interesting point, the conversation we're having, because I've lately noticed um, a growing um, conscious production of memes. So within 4chan, 4chan or Reddit, there's been communities that have been tracking the way memes are produced, they've been following them, they've been stopping them. There is a subreddit called Meme Economy, which basically sees when a, when, a, a re when a meme has been shared by normies too much and, you know, it's time to give it up. Um, and I think it's interesting to link this with the idea that uh, Shion, Sean, Sean um, uh, has um, put forward is that we should encourage, uh, you know, alternative production of memes. But what I want to ask is this, or put forward is this. I don't know if this really answers the question. Should we also encourage 
conscious consumption of memes like within let's say a cultural a critical space like this one should we consider like as a as a consumer of memes as someone who shares and propagates the meme you're also a part of 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 you know the the community uh should you also be a conscious consumer of it should they both go in parallel so i think just this is one half of the conversation just talking about production, I think we should also somehow talk about consumption and how it factors in. Because also, especially now, misinformation and, and false memes, and there's organized trolling communities like, you know, Operation Mindfuck, the happening, that try to kind of falter with, with, you know, the way memes are consumed. And being a m mindless consumer doesn't help. So. Yeah, I, I totally agree with. Uh, that reading of it and my kind of uh, way of thinking about it is the difference between t um, strategy and, and tactics so if you think about strategy that's like established power lines by I don't know uh, the best but okay I'll start again uh, imagine it <laughs> this is from um, Michel Dusseteau the sociologist the walking through the city is a chapter on um, this idea he, he imagines walking through uh, New York appropriately enough, and standing at the top of the um, then standing World Trade Center towers and looking down at the city, looking down at the streets, looking down at the um, uh, the power lines, the buildings that are built by corporations or by municipal agents or they're kind of the power structures in place. And then he talked about walking through the streets at ground level and looking at the kind of shortcuts and the kind of cut throughs, which are the tactics in opposition to the strategy. So the way that maybe the organized trolling operates is almost as a tactic they're kind of rerouting the system they're kind of hijacking within the established power lines of whatever like facebook or you know google or any kind of search mechanism and they are kind of virtuosos they know the internet really well they know how to manipulate it they know how to manipulate the attention economy really well and i think this this point about how do we counter it it's about understanding that think these things are two-way it's not just about um being a um, a consumer or a producer, th 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 you're kind of imbricated within this system and you've got to kind of know it at the tactical level as well as the strate strategic. I saw, I saw a hand over here. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask kind of on this strategy tactics, um, also the panelists, I thought it was really interesting because it's something that I've been thinking about. And my question is, how, how would you relate like so where are the representations of black women and how is blackness kind of uh, people are saying co opted in different ways? And how does chaos relate to power structures and racism? Who is chaos benefit at the end? And who's like really who are the organized trolls? Um, and then uh, what is their kind of role in the system? Because I think that's a uh, so it's a, a kind of two-part question as I see it, um, one being um, uh, who does chaos benefit, um, a kind of sowing of discontent as uh, Hannah, Hannah was discussing um, in a kind of proto-meme situation of printing, um, and another uh, question having to do with um, where, uh, uh, where is blackness in this equation and specifically uh, uh, the representation of black women uh, within meme culture. Um, so. Um, these questions apply to all of the panelists, so I don't know who wants to answer first. Um, sure. Hi. Um, so again, the identity that's represented in the memes um, shows the default of the identity, and the default redditor is shown in like um, the redditor's wife and things like that is a white male, and a meme be is only um, as soon as it diverges from that in any way as soon as it's a woman or as soon as it's um, someone who isn't white then that becomes the defining characteristic of it then it's that idea is like with the um, successful black man they're parodying these um, sort of racist ideals in the form of a meme and there it is that characteristic that defines it um, the same with, with um, when you're talking about gender in terms of these memes, you go for a white woman with good girl Gina because the thing that is being parodied in that meme is gender. It's the one marker, the one step away from the default white man that then is the concentrating factor on it. 
Um, in terms of um, trolling and what these can do in terms of gender, so one of um, a lot of it is disrupting these feminist campaigns because um, um, the idea of a social justice warrior, which was another part of the, um, this research project, and um, and how that has become uh, moved from being a positive term to describe those who are um, politically liberal and towards a pejorative in online forums, especially in hacking and anonymity. And um, one of the best examples of this um, emerged out of 4chan, which was um, Operation Lollipop, in which um, users organized and created um, fake ethnic minority female feminist Twitter users to then um, create negative hashtags and get them trending um, and picked up by feminists who are using Twitter um, such as uh, End Father's Day um, and they picked up and then tried to spread these ideas in a mimetic fashion by using the idea of virality and um, as Hannah says, by knowing how to take these shortcuts and how to work with the affordances and how to move from 4chan onto Twitter and get these ideas spreading. Um, honestly, I think you asked the question of like, who, do, what does, who does chaos benefit? Like, if a troll goes out and you know puts out puts something out, who does it benefit? Um, and a lot of the times you know a trolling attempt like it was mentioned have you know unforeseen consequences or even opposite consequences you launch a nazi nazi meme just to disturb the, f the narrative and then it becomes an independent narrative on its own um and then there's a book that that's written on the discourse of trolls it's uh, called that's why we can't have nice things and she mentions um how there's two written rules in the discourse discourse of most trolls and one of them is everything can be taken seriously you can't put a troll out and and take it seriously everything's just for the lulz. um and i think this is one thing to keep in mind um and then another thing uh where you're mentioning you know where where is you know black memes and and who are the subjects of black memes um and i think it's there are a lot of most memes start out you know black um but the thing is they fall out through their life cycle so you have uh we we talked about a lot of the people reclaiming their memes or making money off their memes so um the the lady that made uh the on fleek um the on fleek meme uh which is one of the most shared one of the most prominent you know words in the, the internet lingo at the moment uh she was completely almost dissociated from the meme and she wasn't able to make any money. And recently, she went on GoFundMe to, to know, you know, start her own project. So I think there is like a big gap between uh, someone who is, you know, white passing that produces a meme as, you know, an imaginative labor, and someone who who is white. So it's it's a thing we have to deal with. Uh, thanks. That was an interesting uh, question and a big one, I would say. Who does chaos? Um, benefit in particular? Well, I think um, history tells us that chaos benefits extreme um, factions, notably fascists, unfortunately, and I think that's what we're kind of countering uh, at the moment. Um, and I think the reason for that is, well, it's, it's kind of, kind of multi multifold, and it's to do with our um, kind of extant political systems, but to use Operation Mind Fuck as an example, that was, as I described, an apolitical uh, tactic. Um, there are similar tactics that have been used that have had political application, notably the, uh, situationism. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with that, that's a, uh, a kind of avant-garde art and kind of cultural theory movement from the 1960s who used these tactical uh, hijacks, uh, these detournements they called them, to um, kind of sh uh, 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 upend capitalism was their agenda. So they were left leftists, uh, left-leaning um, in the main, uh, and they wanted to subvert the kind of signs and messaging strategy of, of capitalism, subvert them to show them for what they were to kind of break the spell, effectively. And that was the same kind of process, uh, same kind of process, but applied with a distinct political agenda. And I would say that the kind of more recent um, uh, iteration of it, the kind of the meme magic has also got a political agenda behind it, although it's more distributed. So I guess what we're looking at here is kind of process and the kind of consequences and why certain things are more successful than others. I mean, I think this is, like I say, a huge question, but I guess within 
kind of a hierarchical capitalist societies it's it's easier to um re restate forms of hierarchy rather than go full egalitarian just because of the way that our entire systems are set up capitalism is is hierarchical because it's to do with the distribution of the unequal distribution of wealth and it's harder to um get a, an egalitarian system going and yet also working at a state of compromise at all times because you are having to live within that system itself so at the moment chaos seems to be benefiting some very dangerous people and i think we need, all need to be vigilant yeah this is just a, a comment um you know i think er earlier i i had um sort of compared the use of memes to a social behavior and um i think one of the most interesting things that comes out of um your presentations is um you know this this strange um uh, you know, sometimes ha the, the, the meme culture having its origin in a particular community um, and then quickly becoming um, a kind of behavior that belongs to no one. Um, so, y you know, it's um, something that Arya Dean talks about in her essay, um, uh, Poor Meme, Rich Meme, and um, this just kind of intense um, ambivalence. I mean, um, just the way things exist on the flattened plane of the internet, right? There's no um, there's no ethnographic field per se. There's 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 no field to go into. It's just all kind of um, on an equal playing field. So you have um, you know this this odd dispersion of just of, of anonymized behaviors. Um, it's just uh, uh, not not a question. It's just something that um, struck me as, as as very interesting in, in your um, in your work. Um, we had a question of, in the audience. Yeah. To this idea of like um, strategically creating memes, and I'm thinking particularly about the U.S. election, like in regards to Keck and the, how Pepe was deployed, and then also how Hillary had the mannequin challenge, and then also thinking about bringing in Bernie's dank meme stash um, as these kind of different um, ways that the meme unrolled in the U.S. election. And I'm thinking about how, I don't know if the Pepe meme can be considered successful, but the, the kind of um, candidate that was supported by them um, won versus Bernie's dank meme stuff, which is also a kind of user-created one, versus Hillary's attempt at being like relevant and internet literate, which was a fail. Um, and so I'm wondering how we can like learn about that and think about that in terms of um, maybe unnaturally starting meme campaigns in the way that I think we started to talk about. But how would you phrase that as a question? <laughs> can, can we strategically create memes? Is that even okay. a thing? Can, just, this is just for the live stream. Uh, can we strategically create memes? I would say it'd be extremely difficult. I think there's a, an only awareness of the being kind of forced meme culture, and I think that those who view themselves to be the original, um, the originators of meme culture, that maybe like Chan cultures in particular, feel savvy enough to detect when it's a, a forced meme, and that immediately delegitimizes it in their eyes. And if they are the ones who are dominating certain areas of um, online discourse, which then per percolates through to other areas, there's a difficulty there of how if it doesn't pass through that route then it's hard to for it to seem authentic to the secondary or tertiary users or in those invested in the meme at a later stage so i'm not sure that that would ever be a valid or viable should i say um ta tactic of resistance Sorry. um I, maybe I just want to bring to light this attempt by informatics to strategically create memes. Uh, and there has been recent um, interest, uh, in, in, in politics at least, to use machine learning to kind of strategically uh, make internet you know, references. Uh, and it's, it's been rumored, I, I don't know how correct it is, that Hillary Clinton used a, um, a learning algorithm called ADA. Uh, that kind of informed a lot of, you know, it, it didn't really say what she used, but I'd imagine that, you know, you'd see that the mannequin challenge is trending somewhere in a, some social sphere, and then it, you know, creates that. But that's not how, how memes work. That's not how they, it, it's not just, vis you have to have a criteria in which to assess the success of a meme, because you asked what is what makes a meme successful, or, you know, it's it's, it's something that needs to be studied more, I feel. Uh, so I don't think you would ever be able to strategically um, deploy a meme and something like Hillary Clinton doing the um, mannequin challenge just is very 
cringeworthy. It's it's something that um, kind of makes the meme die a very, very quick death when you see it propagated in the same way. Um, where if you look at something like Pepe, it wasn't created by the candidate and that was the thing that it emerged out of anonymity. No one quite knows where it came from. It was a resurgence of this um, popular anonymized nostalgia towards something that used to be as a, a post thing that was created by a candidate. I think these cultures and their affinity for OC original content and um, something new and something that you can then track the origin of means that you couldn't really strategically deploy them in a way that they would reach mimetic status. You can make an emergent meme or spreadable media, but to reach that status, I don't necessarily know would be plausible. So I think, oh, I think unfortunately we're out of time. Uh, we're just, uh, uh, maybe we have time for one more question. Let's, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, for, uh, this question is for all the panelists. Um, this is more about the, the communities from which the memes are originally from. Um, this idea of like black Twitter becoming this hub of like pop culture is becoming more of a mainstream idea and people are noticing that. And then like on the opposite side you kind of have like the 4chan community who kind of like works in the underwebs of the internet and like you know spreads the Pepe culture and stuff like that. Have you guys noticed any similarities and differences between these communities in terms of like the patterns of how the memes originate? Are there like certain people within these communities that everybody else knows? Or like the, I guess, like captains of originations of the memes within the communities? Or is it more like the centralized and the people within the communities don't really know each other? Uh, so any final thoughts? Very, very brief, please. Um, so pseudonyms, um, especially on Reddit, do allow um, like this celebrity cultures to exist. Um, there's Violent Traz, who was nicknamed the creepy uncle of Reddit, um, who um, created lots of trolling and sexualized subreddits such as creep shots um, and things like that. So people do develop like this celebrity status. But I don't think you can necessarily um, separate the platforms um, into those, these sort of very divided categories, especially because of the affordances that allow people um, to move between them. Um, I am actually working on a project at the moment that looks at how people discuss gender and identity and hostility between 4chan, Reddit and Twitter um, is something that I'm currently working on. Um, and I would say that it's very hard, obviously, to identify individuals because largely these things are anonymized and then also quickly appropriated. But a characteristic is always very um, uh, um, successful is, is wit, being funny, being a kind of virtuosic wit, referencing the right cultural element, saying the right thing and catching it in the right way. That catches on. That works really well in the attention economy. It gets the point across very quickly. It shows you are kind of a social expert of some kind or a flair. And then it goes from there because we want to replicate that as well. So that tends to work very well. Uh, so the final thought I'd have, you'd ask how a meme originates or, you know, who makes the meme. Um, and I think, you know, both, let's say you, you want to mention, you know, black Twitter and then 4chan. And I think they, they, they feed off each other in a way. You know, 4chan is really good at propagating the idea, making it into into the meme. And I think you have to look at every meme as a process on its own, uh, study every meme, meme on its own. And then a lot of the time 4chan capitalizes on things that, that are artifacts of black culture. And then, you know, they take it as their own. So that's... Uh, so uh, just want to thank all our panelists again, uh, Abdu, Sean, and Hannah, and let's have a round of applause. And thanks for coming. <laughs>